Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Derek Oskal, Senior Program Officer, focusing on the future of work and equitable opportunities here at the Kauffman Foundation. Today, we are hosting a forum to learn more about the connection between gig work and entrepreneurship. Gig work is increasingly in the news, but there are lots of open questions surrounding gig work. For example, are more workers doing gig work? How do we define gig work? What protections and opportunities for advancement do gig workers have? What does the proliferation of digital platforms and gig work mean for entrepreneurship? Gig work can be a second job or it can be a primary source of income. Its importance in a household can range from necessity to luxury, from affording rent and living expenses to having nicer vacations. Types of gig work have quite a range too. For example, low wage food delivery to high wage freelance graphic design. Forthcoming work by Matthew Dennis, Spirit and Lagares, and Margarita Sutsara uses administrative US tax return data to study entrepreneurship in the platform economy. Their preliminary findings show that income derived from platforms help facilitate new firm creation, especially for lower income and younger workers. The researchers find that these gig founded firms are more likely to survive, have more employees, and more likely to be profitable. For some workers, gig work offers a pathway to entrepreneurship. In this forum, our guest speakers will explore the landscape of gig work in the US, the various types of gig work people engage in, the relationship between gig work and entrepreneurship, and what all this means for policy and practice. After the speaker presentations, I will moderate a question and answer period. I encourage you to use the chat feature to send your questions in for the panelists. We host this forum to provide a platform for an in-depth discussion and on how to solve problems. And the Kauffman Foundation does not take a political position or legislative position on these discussions. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Susan Hausman, Vice President and Director of Research, Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. Susan, when you're ready, please take it away. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Derek, uh, for having me here to this very interesting forum. Um, and uh, kind of building off of your, your introductory comments, I'd like to just start uh, uh, by speaking a minute to uh, what, we, what, what is it that we mean by gig work? It actually means different things to different people. Um, it may refer uh, commonly to any type of informal short-term uh, work, uh, it's often called side job or side hustle um, as an alternative term. But more recently, and I think this is what Derek was referring to in his opening comments, gig work has been used to refer to work uh, done through online platforms or mobile apps. This work may be done in person, such as uh, ride sharing, uh, providing ride sharing services on Uber or Lyft, or may be performed online, uh, such as editing or web development to, through a platform like Upwork. I'm gonna focus my remark, uh, remarks today on what I'll call gig platform or just platform work. So um, how prevalent uh, is uh, platform work? Actually, our information on this, as you know, uh, as much attention as it's received in recent years, our information on, how, on the prevalence is quite spotty. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, ran a survey uh, five years ago that collected some information on whether people were working in this. Um, colleagues and I uh, uh, had a survey module that asked a question about it uh, through uh, a Gallup uh, nightly survey. Um, also bank data is often cited, uh, particularly uh, uh, the JP Morgan and Chase Institute has used their data to see how many individuals, their banking customers, are receiving uh, income from one of uh, over 100 plat uh, platforms. Uh, some of these data are somewhat old, however, but consistently at any point in time, typically between one and 3% of, uh, of individuals' workers uh, report receiving uh, income from platforms. Um, People have also used IRS tax data to look at this phenomenon. These are somewhat older data and show uh, the period when uh, uh, platform work was really taking off. Uh, this uh, uh, slide, which comes uh, from uh, a study by uh, Brett Collins and co-authors, shows that 
um, the share of the tax workforce reporting any income uh, from one of 50 platforms during the year increased from zero in uh, uh, 2013 to 1.1%. Uh, that's just in three years, presumably it is uh, followed a similar trajectory upwards. Before moving on, um, I wanna just um, mention that certain types of platforms were largely missed from these measures of gig work. Um, these measures, whether it be from household surveys, the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, data, um, or the tax data, the way people have, have compiled these estimates, typically are not designed to capture platforms like um, Etsy or eBay that may be used to set up online stores, or Airbnb or Turbo, Turo um, that individuals often use to rent their property on a short-term basis. Um, the platforms that are missed, I would argue, um, from standard measures um, may be especially important vehicles for entrepreneurship. Um, we do have a little bit of information on the incidence of work on these sorts of platforms from the Federal Reserve Board, which last year in a survey found that uh, two to three percent of uh, respondents to a survey they conduct uh, sold goods um, uh, uh, in the past month, sold goods that they weren't previously owned for personal use. So things that they had purchased or, or uh, explicitly to resell or um, made themselves. And 1% rented properties uh, through uh, an online platform. So um, turning now to the topic of today, uh, entrepreneurship, I wanna first note that the current focus of the policy debate on platforms, and there's a lot of it, has been on the classification of workers as independent contractors. We are all familiar with the uh, uh, debate in California over AB5 um, and Prop 22 uh, and the quite contentious debate um, uh, in the United States and, and in other countries as well, uh, particularly on the classification of drivers for rideshare or um, uh, uh, delivery service platforms as uh, independent contractors. Um, Less attention, however, is paid to the uh, potentially important role platforms can play in facilitating entrepreneurship. Platforms help workers connect with clients and handle payments. Uh, platforms uh, uh, provide a rating system. So uh, it helps competent individuals build a reputation and a client base, which they may in turn use uh, to spin off uh, businesses on their own. Um, platforms uh, typically require less investment than a traditional business startup. So people can use them um, uh, who, who have uh, to start businesses who uh, don't have the, the means, uh, who are from lower income backgrounds to start up uh, other sorts of businesses. And um, interestingly, researchers find, uh, Derek mentioned some research uh, that's forthcoming, but researchers also find that freelancers working through platforms earn more in the early years than uh, those who don't, which is consistent with this idea that a big hangup is, is connecting with clients and, uh, and building that client base. So just to conclude um, with some uh, thoughts on, on policy, uh, many small businesses fail, especially in the first couple of years. And this is not necessarily because entrepreneurs uh, don't provide good services. They're not good at doing what they, they, they want to do. Um, rather, often it's the case um, that they fail because they aren't good at marketing themselves or they don't have the money to market themselves or perform other sorts of administrative functions associated with running a business. So with that in mind, by assisting with some of the key business functions, platforms may facilitate entrepreneurship and reduce business failures? That's an open research question that I know uh, uh, many are, are investigating now. Um, with this in mind uh, and turning to policy, there's a potentially important role for workforce programs to promote platform work in some circumstances. Think, for example, about the workforce system, the state uh, federal part workforce system that exists in the United States. Some states run uh, through this workforce, these workforce programs that help uh, uh, the unemployed find jobs, run self-employment assistance programs. But these programs are, are typically quite small uh, and not particularly successful. 
these programs could inform clients about uh, new, newer options of starting a business through platforms. Um, platforms um, where uh, platforms, particularly those where work is performed on, uh, online, uh, my colleague Catherine Abraham and, and I have, have argued in a Brookings policy paper, that these may be especially appropriate for older workers or disabled individuals who often want flexible hours or have limited mobility and need remote work. So it may be, a, um, it may be one, of, one vehicle to help uh, older workers who increasingly uh, need and want to work in older ages uh, uh, find jobs. So let me stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Hausman. Really appreciate it. And just as a reminder to everyone in the audience to please feel free to use the chat function to ask questions that uh, you have. And uh, we encourage the discussion about uh, all the topics related around gig work and entrepreneurship. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome our second speaker today, Mr. Xavier de Souza Briggs, Senior Fellow, Brookings Metro, Senior Advisor at What Works Plus. Zav, when you're ready, please take it away. Thanks, Derek. It's great to be with all of you. And I want to thank the Kaufman Foundation for bringing us together. I think this conversation is incredibly timely. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to build directly on, on Susan's findings and on the important work that she that she shared with us. I've uh, noticed a few questions in the chat and I'll start to respond to them as well. My, my remit, as I understand it, is to talk a bit about how policymakers have been thinking about this, are thinking about this, and could think about this um, in, in more effective and, and productive ways. And I, to me, the place to start is, is kind of in a very basic first principles uh, place. Susan talked about definitions, and I'll come back to that. It's like, what is gig work? That's really important for any policy conversation is, is sort of pinning down what you're talking about and who's affected and what the stakes are. But in some ways, you know, even more fundamental is as people um, in the public sector in one role or another, they might be an elected official, they might be running an agency, workforce agency, small business support agency, some other kind of entity. One of the most fundamental questions is, do they see this as a problem to be solved for which we need protective measures, let's say, the sorts of things that we have in, in the way of labor standards and right workplace safety and that kind of thing? Um, do they see it as an opportunity to be garnered and expanded, like Susan's example of self-employment being an intentional focus for some uh, workforce agencies? Is it something to kind of facilitate, accelerate, support for good reasons? Is it just a thing? It's, it's a pattern out in the economy. It's a sign of change. Um, the future of work is here now. You know, work is evolving, especially because of technology, but for other reasons as well. Or is it a bit of all of these? It, you know, is it something requiring protective measures and some supports, um, better data, so, so that we can understand the, uh, the the varied ways that people are bringing in income, um, including the ways that have sort of been hidden, been been hard to discover for reasons that Susan talked about. So I, I want to start there just by naming that that fact. Uh, when you ask the question, how are policymakers thinking about almost anything, a good place to begin is. In, in what you know, in what lens do they do they do they view this? And if you answer that question, I think it turns out that many policymakers, again using that term broadly, have historically thought about this either as um, something kind of residual. What Derek, in your intro, you referred to as secondary, you know, a, a side source of income, or just something you you, you do in your early years to earn a little income um, and prepare for your career. It's not your career, you're not trying to, to make it so. Either to think of it as residual and kind of not important enough to get involved with, e either to regulate or to support, um, or they don't think about it uh, at all. This is historically now, traditionally. It's the neighborhood kid that does babysitting or cuts the grass, um, or it's uh, informal handyman work uh, or that kind of thing. Fast forward just a little bit and digital platforms have changed that pretty dramatically and had an impact on, on uh, policymakers' views as well. And I, without painting with too broad a, a brush, what I wanna stress is that the, the coming of Uber and TaskRabbit and care.com in the caregiving uh, or care work space and, and many others that, that we could name um, has, has forced, if you will, attention 
uh, to, to the other side of non-standard employment or, or whatever we want to label it, and that is the, the predatory side, um, the vulnerability that workers experience when the work they do may be informal, uh, off the books in some cases, uh, not captured in traditional data sources, let alone regulated by, by traditional authorities. And we've seen this around the world, not just in the US, by the way, the fights over uh, Uber's access or Airbnb, you know, for different reasons in a given uh, marketplace. And so this, this second view, wait, wait a second, there's a lot of market power that certain actors have. Is it, is it fair if I go on uh, an app or on a website and I'm looking for care support, but I, I, I need um, you know, just a bit initially, I'm not hiring a person on, a, on regular terms. Is it fair that if I can't negotiate uh, a rate with them um, and I'm pushing them, let's say as the customer, I'm pushing them toward uh, a wage that's not a living wage or even close to that. Is it fair that I can then go ahead and rate them low because they wouldn't grant me the rate that I want? I didn't even hire them. You know, what right do I have to, to rate them? But it turns out policymakers are starting to realize, well, if it's engineered into the code, if it's, if it's a part of the way the platform works, um, yeah, the consumer can do that. And that's not necessarily um, fair. Arguably, it's, it's very unfair to, to workers to sort of be dinged just for trying to negotiate a rate. These are very recent examples, uh, by the way. So now we find ourselves, and I'll, I'll end with this and look forward to the conversation. I think we find ourselves in what could be a, a third place, neither the narrow, this is residual sort of view, doesn't need um, government to attend to it at all, or, or just the second view, gee, this is the latest incarnation of a long pattern in our economy where some workers have been highly vulnerable. Think of day laborers, domestic workers, farm workers in many cases, long history and, and, and patterns of disproportionate um, abuses, wage theft, all kinds of uh, awful things. You know, they're not capitalism, they're not fair, they're not a level playing field, um, they're just ex exploitative. Um, well, now we find ourselves in a, in a third place where we can acknowledge um, gig work is here to stay for many reasons, uh, many of the things driving e-commerce, um, lots of different forms of business innovation, and the important reason that Susan named toward the end of her uh, presentation, and that is it's important for certain kinds of workers to have flexibility. They cannot commit to the either the nine to five or the other sort of standard uh, w2 uh, terms at least conventional full-time work this kind of work access to this kind of economic opportunity is important and not only because it can be a pathway to to entrepreneurship and we we need policymakers frankly to get there faster and to understand there's a place for the protective there's a place for the facilitative and the supportive and i think we need to see now uh, the public sector step up not in a one-size-fits-all way but in different markets across the country recognizing it's here to stay, um, but gig work should be good work, no matter how you find it and no matter how long you do it. And, um, and it can be, and we have, I, I promise I will end on this thought, we have everything from public options for finding this work. So you don't only have to go to uh, Uber or, or Lyft or DoorDash or, or those other sites. These were pioneered, some of them in, uh, in other countries, the UK, uh, for example. Uh, and we see a, um, an innovation scaling in, in Southern California, uh, but a public option where you know the terms you're gonna have and you can keep your record there and you can go on to new kinds of gig work. We also see handy uh, partnering with uh, the national domestic workers. And we see um, high road ride share uh, services and apps that are sharing data with the drivers to empower them so they know where they can generate the most income. So more worker-centered innovations is a simple way to say it and to think about it. Uh, with the head of the workers lab, I put out a piece in Fast Company last fall outlining uh, some of these innovations. It's free online. Um, we can do this and we need to do this and we need to get on with this conversation and, and neither focus on, you know, on the notion that this is small and not very important, it's residual, or it's inherently predatory and all of it must uh, turn into W-2 work else it's a consolation prize, it's second uh, tier work, it's dangerous work. Those are somewhat um, caricatured views, if you will. They're incomplete views so we can understand where they come from and the concerns for fairness, especially that are behind some of those concerns. 
um, we need to move on to you know a, a far more sort of next generation view of this stuff and policy that's responsive, that's protective, but is also pro innovation and protects workers, uh, including those who go on to become entrepreneurs. I'll stop there. Thanks, Derek. Thank you so much, Zab. Really appreciate it. I uh, certainly for me already, lots of uh, themes are emerging regarding. Uh, the wide range of activities, types of work that people do that gets captured under gig work, uh, trying to learn more about the prevalence of it. So uh, just to echo again, to continue to keep uh, asking questions or sharing resources in the chat feature with uh, the rest of the audience. And, uh, you know, certainly the, some emerging themes here too about like in the, in the places where gig work can be that transitionary pathway to entrepreneurship, uh, that is exactly where our, our next speaker will be taking us. Uh, so without uh, further ado, please let me introduce Ms. Hanyi Livia Yi, Assistant Professor of Finance, Boston College Carroll School of Management. Livia, when you're ready, please take it away. Um, so good morning, everyone, and it's a great pleasure to be here. My talk is titled Launching with the Parachute, the Gig Economy and New Business Formation. And this talk is very much based on a joint research paper with two co-authors, John Barrios and Yale Hochberg. I did see a question in the chat about links to research papers, and I will be happy to put a link uh, to the paper in the chat after my presentation. And this one is uh, recently published in the Journal of Financial Economics. So our thought starts from the well-established argument that bearing risk is one of the key features of entrepreneurship. Because the capital markets provides too little capital to entrepreneurs, as a result of moral hazard adverse selection problems, entrepreneurs, they must finance themselves and they must bear the risk of failure. There has been empirical research on this front through the lens of job protection programs and unemployment insurance programs their results are largely consistent with this Nietzschean view of risk bearing in entrepreneurship. So under this Nietzschean perspective, if there is a way to increase entrepreneurial risk taking and to relax personal liquidity constraints, for example, this should allow for additional entrepreneurial activities. And we argue in the paper that the gig platforms provides exactly such opportunities because these platform enabled you know, on-demand gig opportunities, they have two key features, very flexible work hours, as well as very low entry barriers. So they, pro they provide an opportunity for entrepreneurs to supplement their income in the downside state of the world. And more importantly, it provides a fallback option for entrepreneurs. We know that tolerance for failure is a key driver of entrepreneurial entry. And so does the gig economy provide a safety net that makes entrepreneurial experimentation safer? This channel is really interesting because it does not necessarily imply that all affected entering entrepreneurs will be gig workers per se. It's also about the fact that gig opportunities provides an insurance and a peace of mind knowing that it is there if needed and therefore it affects expectations of the interested entrepreneurs. So we empirically test the effect of gig opportunities on new business startups through the lens of Uber and Lyft. And we select these platforms for a few reasons. Some of them are economic reasons and some of them are just data availability reasons. First of all, these platforms entered cities in a staggered fashion and therefore providing a way for researchers to implement a difference in differences approach to better tease out causal effects. And second, these platforms represent two of the first large scale app based gig platforms to roll out across the US and oftentimes they are the first gig platforms to enter a city. So their adoption usually precedes other platforms such as food delivery or errand running or package deliveries. And the third reason we focus on these uh, Uber and Lyft platforms is of course data availability. We have the exact rollout dates accurate to the day for each of these platforms so that the data are more readily available. And when we plot the diffusion of adoption across cities and across populations, the diffusion follows a standard S-curve, which is consistent with the general historical patterns of new technology diffusion. 
Um, so our main outcome of interest is new business formation in a city after Uber and Lyft enters. And we use a pretty novel data set of new business registration records in a local region. So the data were provided to us by the startup cartography project, and the data covers the full universe of newly incorporated businesses in the US. We use a difference in differences empirical methodology, which, you know, roughly speaking, compares trends in new business registrations in cities that have adopted gig platforms to cities that have not. So the graph here plots the coefficient estimates from regression uh, estimates representing the difference in new business registrations across the treated and control cities, as well as the 95% confidence interval bars. So uh, this is done in a regression setting, so we are able to adjust for additional factors such as differences in population base in cities, average income, in macroeconomic trends, as well as city specific time trends. So the red vertical line indicates the year of uh, gig platform entry. We see that prior to entry, there is no systematic differences in new business registrations across treated and control cities. But after entry, the treated cities, which are the ones that adopted one of these gig platforms, they do experience a surge in new business activities relative to control cities. What about the financing channel for these new businesses? We actually find a similarly sized increase in the issuance of small business loans to newly established businesses. Because as documented by the Startup Cartography Project, the vast majority of new business registered in the US are traditional business entrepreneurship, and they typically are financed through some form of debt, particularly small business lending. So we are able to match the business registration data to the SBA loan data based on the names of the businesses and consistent with our finding of an increase in realized business registrations, we show here that there is a corresponding increase in small business lending after the arrival of the gig economy. So here we plot new business registration against Google search intensity for terms related to entrepreneurship, such as how to start a business or how to incorporate. And we use these Google search intensity as a measure of the entrepreneurial interest within a region. So in general, it's not surprising that entrepreneurial interest has a positive relationship with the realized entrepreneurial activities measured by business registration. And importantly, we find that this relationship steepens after the gig platforms become available in a city. So in other words, entrepreneurial intent is more likely to transform into actual entrepreneurial behaviors when gig opportunities become available in a region. And again, this supports the notion that the gig economy provides, you know, perhaps a safety net that motivates the would-be entrepreneurs to take risks and become actual entrepreneurs. We also identify uh, one mechanism driving the growth in the post gig entrepreneurship, which is this employment fallback or insurance option provided by the gig economy. So if the gig increases new business activities by reducing the uncertainty associated with entrepreneurship, then the effects should be larger in locations where ex anti economic and entrepreneurial uncertainty is the highest. So to capture this notion, we use four proxies for ex ante economic and entrepreneurial uncertainty, and these are measures related to wage growth, related to entrepreneurs' earnings, as well as the, bit, uh, the bankruptcy rate of businesses. And in all cases, we find that the relation between gig arrival and new business formation is more pronounced in locations where there is higher ex ante uncertainty. So this is evidence consistent with this insurance or safety net mechanism. So several additional findings. First of all, there is a sizable increase in Google search intensity for terms related to how to start a business or how to incorporate following gig entry, suggesting that entrepreneurial intention or entrepreneurial interest goes up. We do not find a statistically significant change in the average quality of new businesses or the geographic concentration of new businesses within a city. 
We find that the increase in new business registration is larger in cities with a lower fraction of population with a bachelor's degree. So this would be consistent with the safety net mechanism being more valuable and more important for lower education entrepreneurs. We also look at credit constraints and we find a U-shaped pattern. So the increase in entrepreneurial entry are concentrated in the lowest as well as the highest quartiles of credit score. So the large effect in the lowest quartile credit score would be consistent with the gig providing safety net and increased risk bearing. And then the large effect in the highest quartile, which are the least credit constraint areas, would be consistent with the demand side factors, such as demands for new business activities within a region playing a role. So uh, to conclude, at the digital economy, you know, gig platforms, they may have a positive labor market spillover effect. And this is the spillover effect on local entrepreneurship. The channel that we focus on in the paper is that the gig opportunities could provide a form of insurance or a form of safety net against entrepreneurial related income volatility, as well as other sources of risks. And consistent with this view, we find that a four to six percent increase in new business registrations uh, following gig entry, we find a similarly sized increase in small business lending, so in the financing to the new firms, and these effects are particularly strong in cities with more volatile entrepreneurial income and success rates to begin with. And we may expect that these are the areas that we're especially interested in encouraging new entrepreneurial activity. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olivia. I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, now we're going to transition uh, this forum into a, a question and answer period. So uh, please encourage you to continue to use the chat feature to share questions and resources uh, with everyone participating and joining us today. And certainly, as you know, thinking about all of the themes and and parts of the discussion we've heard so far, uh, one thing that you know, pops up very quickly, I, I think, is that when we use the term gig work, no matter how we define it, and, and you know, Susan, thank you so much for starting with that as, as like kind of the key point, that you get a really wide range and it, it kind of uh, encapsulates the messiness and the, um, I, I, to me, it feels like a little bit of the transition about the way we work, where we do work, how we work, and it can be transitory for some people, but it can also be re relatively long form. And I think Zab made a great point too about making sure that no matter when you're doing it and for what reason, it can, that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be good, be a good job as well. And so I just wanna talk a little bit more about like, how should we be thinking of, like is gig work even the right way to think about all of the things we talked about? Like if you are cap, uh, encapsulating such a wide range of activity, uh, is this even the best way to, think about this type of work uh, and the supports needed. Derek, I'll, I'll dive in. Um, I think that, you know, on one hand, it's far more important that we rapidly get to a place where we understand a lot better the range of different ways that people are generating income, their sources of income, in other words, and how to think about expanding good opportunity, regardless, as you say, of, of why and for how long and at what age, et cetera. I think that's much more important than that we agree on a term. I appreciate the importance of the question, but I, I'm gonna maybe, uh, maybe uh, provoke everybody a little bit. Let's embrace the mess. I, I don't care that gig means a lot of things. If it's a shorthand for the moment and you know, someone else wants to say non-standard employment, uh, terms like flexible employment ha have their own, um, you know, pluses and, and minuses. I think we're in a much more promising place now, thanks in part to technology and innovation, than we were, let's say, 25 years ago when the country had a love affair with micro enterprise, and we pushed aggressively. And philanthropy was a part of this. The, the idea that we should make it much easier to, to sort of launch a micro enterprise, et cetera, et cetera, it was inspired in part by the importance of that kind of mechanism in the developing world, in the global south, where a lot of employment traditionally has been so-called informal or non-standard, and a lot of it off the books. Um, it, 
didn't work very well here in America. We weren't quite ready to work with that. And many things have changed that. And I, I think it's okay that we see this variety. We just need a more complete picture. We need a data infrastructure to go with it. And we need to commit to some principles like we're talking about here. Protect, encourage, you know, uh, respect the fact that it's gonna mean different things for different people. Uh, let me let me jump in as well in terms of the term. Um, I personally don't use gig uh, to refer reference uh, uh, platform work, um, just a personal preference, but I know it often is. Uh, and it kind of relates to a question that came in from uh, Alan, Alan uh, Kirster, um, uh, about, uh, you know, how, how should we be referring? Uh, gig doesn't sound quite right when you're talking about freelance uh, professional workers. Incidentally, uh, from a, a methodology perspective, measurement perspective, to just getting a handle on how many of these workers are out there. Um, it, it's hard to frame questions on surveys because many people, if you used, for example, the term gig, um, uh, many people say, oh, I'm not a gig worker. That sounds derogatory. So you don't pick them up. Or conversely, if you use independent contractor, something like that, you uh, are working for a platform, people might say, well, that's a professional occupation. So in, in, in some senses, uh, how we talk about these things really matters quite a lot. Um, I wanna uh, pick up on, on the what Zaz said, which is, is that you know, the, the platform work is a new technology and uh, it, it spans a wide range of occupations. We have everyone, everything from, from uh, dog walkers up to very uh, you know, high level professional web, web developers engaging in platforms to get new work. And by virtue of the fact that it's a new technology and a new way to work, we don't have a set of rules for regulating this work. And so on the one hand, we can see problems with it and we need to respond. It's not black and white. On the other hand, there are some advantages that uh, you know, uh, uh, Livia and, and I just uh, pointed out in our talks that can uh, potentially promote entrepreneurship. So we, uh, in fashioning policy, we need to strike a careful balance, but, but uh, you know, it, it, to some degree, this is part and parcel of the new technology. Uh, perhaps to extend on that, so thinking through the messiness of uh, the economic and work activity that is captured in these topics, however defined, and thinking through uh, on that, you know, the actionable level, you know, a question that came in, I think is particularly relevant, like, you know, how, what recommendations would you give a local economic development agency who wants to support gig work in the community? Uh, what, what does that look like? What should they be thinking about, even if you don't have a specific solution? Um, what types of things would you recommend kind of at that local level looking at? Um, that, that's a, a tough question, but I, I think that uh, one, one of the considerations is, is, is that um, uh, you have to, one uh, local economic development agency would need to be careful with uh, uh, promoting uh, platforms for reasons that uh, as Zaz pointed out, I mean, there may be ones that uh, aren't good uh, for, for workers. Uh, that don't lead to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, long-term good uh, career trajectories and others may. We're still figuring that out. The research is very much in progress, but uh, you know, being careful um, uh, and there may be certain, as, as I pointed out, there may be certain types of people for whom this is a really uh, good vehicle for uh, finding work. Uh, this, uh, uh, you know, may be uh, a good opportunity for those who don't have, as, as Livia pointed out, uh, a lot of, of capital, a lot of financing uh, to get their foot in the door. So just being quite selective, working with reputable platforms, uh, thinking about who might uh, be uh, uh, benefit from uh, uh, experimenting with this type of work. Eric, I'll, I'll dive in. feel like I've been talking too much and hope that Livia will share her thoughts. It's a really important question. As Susan said, it's a tricky one. I, I think 
my instinct on this, given what we observe around the country, my, my advice is um, to start in two places or, or to think of this as having an, at least two dimensions. So one is under the find good work frame and the other is under start your own business. And we've been exploring, of course, in this conversation, how those are not mutually exclusive, um, especially now, but they're a bit different, right? Um, they can sometimes attract people with somewhat different goals, or at least a sense of, of sort of where they're headed. And I think under the fine good work um, umbrella, on the one hand, we see historic labor shortages. It is a workers' market, at least in in some respects. Um, and the tight labor markets are, are, are driving all kinds of uh, of change, improved wages, and and other things, and also, of course, shortages in, in the ability of businesses to to produce services and goods. It's a very tricky time in the economy right now, but. Now and for the longer haul, I firmly believe we, we need good public options for finding good gig work. At the end of the day, it's, it's good for the marketplace and for the worker to at least have a public option available. Um, and as I learned in the course of doing some of this research, some of this goes back to the Great Depression. At the time, they were the wrong kind of middlemen, frankly, exploiting people who were desperate for work uh, by selling worthless lists of jobs. Um, and that inspired the creation of the first generation of, of public options where the public sector offered information um, to help workers find, find their way to good work. So don't take for granted that you know, work is out there for all who can do it. No need to think about this. To have a public option for learning what your options are, learn a little bit more about the terms that different platforms offer, those kinds of things. Um, in some cases, even work for local government in a flexible way. Some local governments are, are sourcing services this way. I think that's important for our labor market under the realm of, under the umbrella of, of good work. And then I think number two, um, it's also useful for reasons in particular that Livy's research shows to uh, integrate this, at least begin to integrate this into one's small business support strategy, to, to think of this as one pathway, certainly not the only one, but as, as one source of budding entrepreneurs um, made possible uh, in part because of the way that technology is changing the economy. Um, I just want to add a few comments on top of um, what Susan and Xavier was talking about. So one interesting finding in our research paper is that in regions where the average education level is lower, we find that the effect of the gig platforms in stimulating new business activities is the largest. And the same goes for high credit constraint areas in areas where is, there is a very large group of subprime borrowers or areas where the average credit score is lower. We do find that the really the value of the gig platforms is the largest to the extent that it stimulates the most entrepreneurial, new entrepreneurial activities. So, you know, when we think about the channels through which gig platforms can help local labor market, of course, we we have people who take this as their main job and people who take this as their kind of second jobs. And so this provides an income supplement. This can provide a safety net that's in a similar spirit to unemployment insurance, for example. And this helps uh, people to establish relationships with each other. So to some extent, it also helps to build social capital in a region. And I, I think more research should definitely be done on which groups of individuals are the most affected by these platforms. And so that would perhaps give us a better idea of, of, of what new policies can be in place to help communities to support the gig platforms. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we're we have about ten minutes left in the question answer period. We have several questions. Uh, we probably won't be able to get to all of them. So I'm, I'll try to combine a few themes uh, of those that are coming in. And uh, Livia, your last comment kind of addresses uh, a question from the audience. You know, thinking about the economic mobility for people who were previously unemployed or in low wage work, is that particularly relevant? Um, you know, this type of work. You know, we've talked a little bit about pathways. Uh, public options that might be able to offer things that are that are separate or that are kind of help empower the worker and uh, zab your comments earlier too you know certainly around worker-led innovation in this space and so i guess to kind of summarize a, a few of these questions uh, um, into a, a theme 
which is that you know one of the uh, values certainly for many workers about this type of gig work or whatever we may call it is it's, it's flexibility and the importance of flexibility is a signal for uh, you know the other aspects of their life like flexible work may be the only type of work available because they you know don't have you know regular access to transportation or caregiving and, and so the flexibility of work that gig work offers is the key attribute. And so it makes it so that might be the only type of work that they could do. So thinking about the benefits that uh, are affordable by this type of work with the uh, concerns that might be like, you know, how do we help everyone, you know, if they want to transition from that type of work to creating their own business, like what types of support structures are needed? Or if they, uh, if it is a pathway for some people like, um, even while they're doing that work, like how do we make sure that the right worker protections are there uh, since the classification of worker may not offer them the same protections in, in many cases. So all of a long way to say like, how can we take advantage of the positives that this type of work arrangement affords while thinking about addressing the challenges and the shortcomings of this type of work? Super easy question to fix and solve. So anyone who wants to start, go ahead. Susan, did you want to? It's all you. Yeah, I I, I was uh, going to jump in, but but uh, you you should feel free to to uh, go first, and I'll say a few words. It, Derek, um, first of all, and and your portfolio, I think, in, in embodies this. Uh, please don't hear this as as faint praise. I I. I really give Kaufman a lot of credit. I mean, I think signaling that the future of work is already here, that tackling these questions and not just obsessing on are the robots coming for jobs, right? That, that fixation on automation. Of course, we should keep an eye on that. We should understand its dimensions, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much more to the future of work than that. And so much of the future is already here. In fact, it's been with us for years and years. Dramatic outsourcing, you know, the growth of uh, non-standard employment of multiple kinds, not just the platform kind, as important as that is. So I think point number one, um, we need to start, and some of this will be a local conversation, some of it will be a state conversation. The federal government is interested in this, but even there, there are some out of date, I would say, mental models. Um, when it comes to understanding uh, what this means, there can be some tendency to think of it only as what I call the consolation prize, you know, or a second tier form of work, as opposed to something that the economy and many workers need uh, for a variety of reasons. So I think, you know, point number one is we have to commit to ensuring uh, quality and appropriate protections. We've got to improve information, number two, that's often a role for, for public policy is to increase transparency um to make the, the terms available to workers regardless of their specific goals um more easy to understand and and backed by sort of a broad public interest in sharing that information as opposed to the interest that a company might have in creating a particular view of signing up you know to be one of its drivers or one of its care providers etc cetera, etc cetera. again i think this is a yes and proposition. Um, those business innovations will continue, but the public sector has a certain obligation here to provide better information. And a good place to start uh, locally is by saying, you know, if I embrace those principles, um, I can do something about information. I can learn about these public options and how they function and how they expand uh, options uh, for workers. And gee, I can, I can build on this research and think about um, think about advertising the fact that one can use platform apps or other uh, entry points for gig work to launch a business and grow a business more formally, um, you know, and, and take it to a new place. And it's not uh, a heavy lift to make those initial steps. Um, I, uh, I, I agree with everything that, that Zaz just said. Um, uh, I think it's it's a kind of uh, a case by case basis in terms of thinking about what sorts of protections might be afforded uh, to workers. Um, the there's such uh, the different types of platforms are so heterogeneous. Um, 
almost everyone on a platform, not everyone, but most people on who work for uh, three platforms are classified as independent contractors. As an independent contractor, you don't have access to workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, basic employment protections like uh, wage, uh, uh, wage and hours laws, um, nor do you have access to any company provided benefits. And you know, that's, that, that's it. Uh, there may be circumstances where uh, uh, you know, perhaps the public policy should, uh, uh, direction should be uh, providing those, uh, some of those things outside of uh, the employment employer uh, employee traditional channel. Uh, but in other cases, uh, some may decide that these workers should be classified by virtue of the type of work that they do to be classified as, as employees and not independent contractors. And that's an ongoing uh, debate. But I agree with what Zaz just said uh, concerning um, uh, the importance of, at a minimum, uh, there's a role for public policy in providing more information to workers who are uh, uh, using these platforms. I also uh, thought if I have just a minute to quickly address uh, Hannah and Peter's uh, questions on rural and uh, you know things. Well, uh, rural is near and dear to my heart because I actually live in a rural area and what is the uh, potential for um, platform work in, in rural areas? There's a lot of interest in it. Uh, there has been um, uh, the first step, however, uh, in helping to connect rural workers uh, to the platform economy is uh, getting better internet service out to rural areas. Absolutely essential. And in terms of Peter's uh, question, um, I think that what he was getting at was he didn't see how these pathways actually worked. So when I was uh, interviewing or, or conducting focus groups for this survey uh, with through a Gallup survey that I mentioned, uh, just by happenstance, a, a few things came up and I'll just mention these, for example, um, one young African-American man that we interviewed uh, 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 self, it was self-described entrepreneur. And when we asked him how he was doing this, he was buying um, uh, uh, old uh, video games, packaging them and selling them in an online store that he created on eBay. Um, uh, in a poor neighborhood in uh, uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where my institute is located, you had, um, uh, uh, individuals uh, who owned cars um, were uh, providing them to other people in the community to buy and share. Uh, and so I'm sure that individual who owned the car took a cut, but you can see this kind of thing um, uh, um, mushrooming. Many people, um, uh, the Airbnb phenomenon and other platforms just upended uh, one's ability or the ease of renting at one's own home. And we can see that they are challenging hotels in many major markets. That's a really new and recent, uh, really new phenomenon. So we are running up against uh, the end of our, our, our time together and we have far more questions than time to answer. So perhaps to help synthesize and, and, and close out here, I think one thing that uh, is emerging here is there's a tremendous amount of interest in understanding this phenomenon and how to better support the workers, because that's that's why we're all here today, is to better understand what people need and what these transitions mean, what supports are lacking, what prospects there are, because there are certainly are you know the opportunities you know, the, uh, that there are good aspects about this type of work arrangement, um, but there are concerns as well too. And so, thinking through um, you know all of the different issues that you know that this can be looked at through a lens of like location and geography from demographics of the workers themselves uh, and then thinking through like the policy mechanisms in play too from the local state federal level there are lots of different area areas where this topic can be discussed so perhaps in conclusion just uh, a, a quick uh, question to the panelists to like what one if you to summarize one takeaway someone's just joining right now what would you say to focus uh, that you think is the most interesting thing to think about or an important takeaway uh, or a lesson where you think there should be more more time, like a key thing to, to bring attention to? Derek, uh, let me cheat a little bit. Here's a, here's a one-two. I think that um, 
it's really important, and I hope, especially thanks to Livia and Susan, we've offered a more informed picture, uh, you know, a, a more rounded view uh, of, of what's at stake here and, and what's growing and why. It's really important to understand this is no panacea. Tech enabled or not, um, the availability of certain uh, newer generation options doesn't manufacture demand, you know what I mean? It doesn't create a local market in and of itself. Um, it, it doesn't add customers and, and, and income, not inherently, I mean. So all the old rules, or many of them anyway, still apply. If you have uh, 10 providers of something and you go to 50 overnight, thanks in part to technology, but you've got the same amount of income, they're cannibalizing each other's business. Do you know what I mean? That, 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 that reality of, of business life still applies no matter the changes we've seen. And, and then number two though, though it's no panacea, this can be both a source of good work in our more traditional sense of that, of employment opportunity, but also um, another entry point for entrepreneurship, which is enormously meaningful. It's important for our economy. It's important for, um, you know, for sense of pride and, and purpose for many people. So gig work, whatever we call it, can be both of those. And that's what I hope people would take away. That's my two cents anyway. I think that one of the you know, greatest uh, challenges is uh, uh, lifting up uh, those who are uh, poor, uh, uh, less advantaged. Um, their employment problems are the most stubborn. I think that some of the more interesting work is uh, the kind that, that Livia and her co-authors have done and the, the, uh, the study that you mentioned by uh, Dennis uh, Lagrasse and Susas. Um, where they're showing or they're, they're, they're finding uh, that some connection between growth of platform work and entrepreneurial activity in, um, in uh, lower income areas. I think that's important. It's important to dig down uh, both of these large scale uh, 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 statistical studies, uh, potentially also with some uh, ethnographic studies that would uh, get at uh, uh, better at, at some of the the, the sort of pathways that people are taking. Um, so I remember, so this is supposed to be like a summary part uh, of, of the, the talk. So I will try to be brief. Um, I think one important takeaway from at least my research and a few other research in a similar field is that there could be spillover effects uh, in the local labor market as a result of the entrance of these gig platforms. So it's not specifically about the platforms affecting workers who participate. So the platforms affecting gig workers, of course. On the other hand, it can have spillover effect in the region more generally. And this is because it provides you know, a, a safety net, as I was talking about, kind of like an unemployment insurance for people who want to experiment with new business ideas and therefore you know, it can have spillover effects on new business activities more generally. Um, and I, there, there were a few comments in the chat that I saw was specifically directed about the research paper. So just to answer them briefly, there was a comment about the effect on unincorporated uh, new businesses. That's not the focus of our paper, but I'm aware of another paper written by Birch and co-authors that's published in Management Science. And they actually show that self-reported self-employment in the uh, survey of, of, of population actually goes down as a result of the entrance of the platforms. And they also use a difference in different strategy to tease out sort of uh, causal effects from simply correlation studies. And one mechanism there is the gig workers, they report themselves as being uh, working for the gig economy as opposed to being self-employed. So there could be kind of a mechanical drop in self-employment as a result. And then there was another comment by Peter, I believe, about uh, teasing out correlation, uh, causation from correlation, as well as seeing the connection between gig platforms and entrepreneurship. Um, there are more than one connections between entrepreneurship and gig economy that comes to mind, but to name a few, this provides an income supplement and relieves wealth or, or financial constraints for entrepreneurs, this can provide a fallback option or an insurance mechanism for potential entrepreneurs to experiment their perhaps risky business ideas. And perhaps this can also serve as a, a marketing mechanism for entrepreneurs to be connected with their clients. And uh, we have 
you know, a long section in the paper dedicated to trying to tease out causality from correlation. So I won't go into detail here, but the main empirical approach is a difference in differences strategy. And we talk about what assumptions we're making and because this is obviously a very, very important piece of the research question. Thank you, Olivia. And, and thank you uh, to Zab and Susan as well so much for your time. I, I, I know that our time today is done, but the conversation is not over because this is a very big conversation and it will continue. And I want to you know, thank everyone for attending as well, too. Uh, just as a note, the forum has been recorded and we'll share the video in the future. Uh, in the chat, you'll see a link to some previous recordings are available as well, too. Uh, in the chat, you'll also see a link to our next online event. On June 7th, we'll host a forum about the recent updates to the Kauffman Entrepreneurship Indicators. This will include some uh, trends on the new employer business series and the Kauffman Indicators of Early Stage Entrepreneurship. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, you know, so many more questions than we had time for and so much more to chat about this. But for now, uh, we hope that you can join us for our future events. Thanks again and have a great day.